Welcome to Wisco Dice. Okay, today we're actually going to go ahead and put together a little video here for you to give you a rough idea about the kind of materials that you can use for making and manufacturing your own terrain. After all, as you can see, what you're looking at right now are a bunch of awesome Games Workshop terrain kits. I can't say enough about the all the terrain kits that Games Workshop puts out are all just wonderful. There's lots of really cool little bits and parts and pieces that you can incorporate into all sorts of projects, whether it's a project for your miniatures or you know for something on their bases, or if it's a project for actually bringing to your tabletop as a piece of terrain and scenery. You will note that every Games Workshop piece just about has about eight billion skulls on it, and is very empire centric so maybe you want a piece of terrain that reflects a battle you want to play out in the jungles of Lustria or maybe you want a table that sweeps the sands of the deserts of Kemri so there's you you know at some point most people get to the point where they don't want to play with sheets pulled over the top of books representing buildings on a table the, and they maybe they don't want to shuck out the cost for some of the Citadel kits. Maybe they don't want to just go ahead and uh, be creative and expose that level of creativity. So I want to try to break down all of the kind of materials that I have as the Conzi here in the Duke and Self Dungeon. And this is kind of a pretty much an overview of all the major products that I use. Um, on a regular basis. There's still some other items that are kind of nice to have but aren't really necessarily critical to the terrain manufacturing process. I'll talk about those kind of items and how you might use them in later tutorial videos intended to kind of demonstrate and teach you special techniques about how you use or craft some of these items so that maybe it'll help with some of the episodes we've been doing on the main show on the regular podcast about uh, these terrain days and stuff like that is for gearing up for mayhem and we've talked about products like Hearst Arts and resins and hot wire knives and those kind of things uh, try to help put some of that into into some kind of perspective for you as our listener so without further ado let's look, go ahead and look at the first and foremost thing that I think every terrain person needs to to have in their collection when you start working on projects terrain and that's going to be paint okay uh, terrain pieces tend to be larger pieces and if you're going to paint them with your miniatures paint which you're more than welcome to paint with it's going to cost you a small arm and a leg uh, because miniatures paints tend to be very expensive so what I've got here is uh, an example of like you can see there's an interior flat latex paint that you can go down in any any DIY store, or Home Depot, Lowe's, Menards, whatever it is in your neck of the woods, you can buy a can of any colors you want. That happens to actually be a can of green paint, I think. Uh, kind of a darker green, a little bit darker. I think it's supposed to be a dark, look close to a dark, what the old Dark Angels green was. But then I've got a bunch of other crafts paints here that I've picked up from various stores, whether they're uh, discount stores or the local hardware store down the street here. I've actually gotten some from uh, Michael's. I, I pick them up wherever. Usually if I'm in the store and I'm shopping for something else, I'm like, ooh, there's craft paints. What do I kind of need in my collection? And I pick up one or two bottles. Um, I tend to, I, I would highly recommend almost all terrain that you're working with is going to be in natural colors. So I recommend picking up a big, and you can see I have a large bottle of black and brown there. I can highly recommend picking up a large bottles of, of black and brown, found, kind of your foundation colors, and then smaller bottles of like your mixer colors, the different shades or whatever. Uh, that's, you know, perfect. Next up, I wanted to go ahead and get into, obviously when you have paints, we've got to talk brushes. So I've got a various pile of brushes here from a pretty standard old beater paintbrush from models that I beat up to the point where I didn't want to feel good about painting with models on models with it, to a couple of larger brushes. You can see there's an old Games Workshop tank brush that's been beating the dickens out of, and, and a, another bigger brush that's 
I don't know, about, a, about an inch wide for some larger strokes. And then obviously, then I think there's a two inch brush there as well um, for some really big projects. And these get, you know, terrain are larger projects. They're not like working on your little miniature. Sure, maybe working on some of the fancier GW kits where you have lots and lots of details you could spend all day and a month of Sundays on. But when you're working on a big piece of, of foam similar to this, it, you don't want to sit there all day and work on that project. You definitely want to pa you want to be able to get that painted, get it done in a hurry, and move on to the next thing. All right. So what else do you really need? The next thing I'd like to go ahead and point out is not that resin actually, although I want to talk about that in a second. Are our glues. So I've got a, a couple of glues that are used all the time when working on terrain. And that's going to be uh, the first. This is this is a product made by Eileen's. It's a tacky glue. It's kind of sticky. It holds your stuff in place very well uh, as you're putting things together. Um, I got turned on to it when I started working with Her Starts Bricks because it's actually the product they recommend. So I'm like, okay, I'll just buy the recommended product, and I've kind of stuck with it. Now I don't. You don't necessarily have to buy the name brand when it comes to tacky glue, but I happen to buy Eileen's, and that's. Uh, pretty much the, as far as I know the name brand here in the US. Uh, then there's I have a bottle of St. Elmer's Glue All. It's the basic generic PVA glue or the, or the white glue as a lot of people here know it as. Uh, it, it's a say all, use all. I've talked to people at a new terrain that have also recommended getting wood glue. I don't personally stock it in my collection of terrain supplies but you certainly something that you could play with. It's an optional. I would put it as one of those optional items. Finally, I've got a bottle of super glue there. Uh, it's always useful to have a bottle of super glue. You might have a project where you're trying to stick something and it just won't quite stick to whatever you're sticking it to. Please note though, like I showed you that piece of blue foam, that piece I'm working on, don't super glue blue foam. It will melt it and that's the end of the story. So there's your t t glues. Uh, next up in kind of the parts and pieces that I wanted to point out here is I've got uh, a myriad of these canisters of shakers of flock and static grass. Now this is obviously in larger volumes than you would necessarily buy for your miniatures and these are in these bottles are actually nice handy to do shaker bottles let me go ahead and zoom out here just to talk to you. You can see these shaker bottles. They pop open. You got a shaker. And these are made by Woodland Scenics. Uh, they make this stuff for model railroading layouts. You know, it's it's a great to have in, in large volume when you're dealing with these large pieces or when you're dealing with a lot of pieces. Like this, just this blended, this green blend of the blended turf. That's my second bottle of it in probably uh, two months with all the terrain I've been working on lately. So it's really, uh, so I've been using a lot of it. Um, and, and having it in the shaker bottle would be very easy to spruce. Now I didn't have to get a shaker bottle. I could, they, they do sell it in little plastic bags as well. Um, and I do have a lot of those. Um, it's also kind of nice, you, you've seen in some of the projects I posted, um, a product so they can have a clump foliage, which is this stuff, and it's it's just more coarse. You can kind of see there. And I also really like to use lichen, and they come in comes in various colors, and it really makes a, a nice effect on your terrain pieces. So. Um, because it does cover larger surface areas rather than the smaller surface areas. Now I do have a couple like in that pic that shot I had you saw there was a coarse ballast. I got some ballast in a couple different colors. It works out as a nice gravel piece. Uh, me personally when I'm working with terrain I like using either sand or if I want larger stone pieces like rough ground I like instead of using ballast which tends to be very very round. It does not tend to be different in texture. I like to use a mix of maybe ballast and cat litter, and cat litter is dirt cheap. You can buy that for almost nothing. Same thing with sand. Like when I would deal with terrain, like you know, your war years, you like, to, oh, good lord, sand is expensive. It's like five or ten bucks for a little cup, like a half cup or a cup of it at the at the game store. Well, 
you get your DIY store, you can go down and pick up various different grains and types of level sand um, in 50 pound boxes. So uh, you definitely, or in 50 pound bags. So definitely an option for you as a terrain uh, manufacturer is to have that in your arsenal of, of, of stuff. Another product that we've talked about on the show when I was doing the foam core house is, is spackling. This is a, happens to be a, a lightweight spackling product. It's very nice to use. Um, you can spread it over the top of projects to kind of fill in gaps. It uses a gap filler. It's fairly durable. Now, obviously, it doesn't necessarily take, take the same kind of beating as, say, green stuff or something like that. But when you have... When you're dealing with the larger surface areas like you are with terrain, uh, $10 with green stuff or $2 of wall spackling, uh, it seems to me to be a, a no-brainer there. All right, let's go ahead and we'll talk a little bit about tools next. I still have a bunch of supplies here out spread out on the table, but I want to talk specifically about some additional tools I use. So we'll just pan down here to All the right. tools. So what do I have here? I have... A couple of hobby knives, like here's your standard hobby knife. Uh, probably have it, everybody already probably has it for putting together models, scraping mold lines, that kind of thing. I also have this larger one, it looks like a scalpel. Um, it was a product made by Woodland Scenics, I think they still have it. Um, I'm pretty sure because I can still get these blades from them. And I think it was an eight or ten dollar knife, and it's it's a foam. It's intended for cutting uh, the foam products, um, which I haven't shown yet. But I'll show a, a piece of what they call blue foam or pink foam uh, in a in a bit. I also keep a scissors. This is great for cutting plastic card. It's great for cutting um, cardboard. It's great for cutting a various number of things. Uh, that you, you may have as projects, so it's good to have that handy. Most of us already have a scissors. This is a specialized, this is not a device you would really need, but it's a specialized device, knife, um, exacto knife used for cutting foam. And this is kind of great because it lets me cut at 45 degree angles as well as straight up and down. So that's kind of nice. It's got this little bracket, so that's why I picked that up. Um, if you're working with wire or something like that, you might want to metal snips to just uh, go ahead and cut that those those metal bits, tape measure of some form, I like a metal ruler um, for making sure you have a nice straight edge for measuring lines as well as and you can see that this one's been used quite a bit by the kind of pen markings and whatever that's next to the numbers but I, I like recommend a, a good metal ruler, I like getting the models that have a little bit of cork on the back of them um, helps them stick while you're holding them down and drawing your straight, straight lines Sandpaper. This is huge. When you're working with foam, especially, uh, it's it's really nice to be able to sand down um, rough edges from your knife cuts or your hot wire knife cuts, and so that's very nice to have um, around. Um, note that when you're sanding with foam, you should probably wear a mask and and be in a pretty well ventilated area. The the foam uh, particles are toxic and could hurt you. So. I also have a sandpaper sanding block. Um, you can see mine's pretty well. This piece of sandpaper's been pretty well beaten up, uh, but I've still got some good usage out of it, and I've been using it with um, sanding down her starch blocks, so I can hold the block and sand away. Um, I can do that with other things too, I suppose. Um, but that's kind of the primary thing I use that for. Final thing I'll point out is you want to have a nice collection of ball pipe pens some kind of permanent marker, this happens to be a Sharpie, it's a name brand here, and pencils, I, I do recommend pencils as well, um, available to you while you're working on your terrain projects, both for jotting down notes, maybe you have something you're working on and you need to uh, make sure that you remember your, your instruction set, but then also of course you want to make sure that you have one, there's um, a technique where you can draw on foam with a ballpoint pen to make like say patterns, it works really slick. Um, and you can go ahead and, and do some other really cool fancy things with it. Let's go ahead and talk about some additional materials we've got on the table here. So if I zoom up up here, you'll see a number of items. Now I've got on the left hand side are a couple of baggies and in these baggies are, are bricks that are cast from various Hearst Arts projects and molds. 
So here I've got some doors, I've got some other bricks. And these aren't bricks that I actually cast, so I'm not super ecstatic with them, but they'll be used in various terrain projects. I'm not going to let them go to waste um, to make some just random bits on the table, maybe maybe some uh, ruins or something like that might be ideal. I think that bag's labeled Fieldstone, Dun Fieldstone Dungeon, and this one I've got here is Fieldstone Ruins. So I'll use those to kind of put together some really cool little uh, ruins and, and various pieces. I might take some of those door bits out and use them in buildings or something like that too. Um, and then we've got rubber bands. This is great for when you're trying to work with a project and you need the project to kind of, steer, it won't hold together. Maybe you're, like Brian talked about with his Dark Elf Tower, it's this long cylindrical kind of uh, structure as you see from the pictures on the website that he is going to then glue dowels to. Well, the dowels are going to need, uh, aren't, you know, since it's a kind of a curve to it, he's, they're not going to, they're straight. You know, dowels are straight, so he's going to use these, use these rubber bands to snap those, to kind of snap and hold those uh, dowels in place while the pro while the glue dries and the project sets up. Um, I like to have cotton balls. Now these are great for modeling too because they can be great features if you're like into 40k or or you have like a, some fire or something like that you're trying to put on a piece. These are great for doing smoke. I like using them for that. Um, like say some flaming fences or barricades or something like that. I also have some just some sticks here out from right, gathered out in the front yard. Now of course you can use these for your miniature spaces as well, you know. Um, they tend not to be quite durable enough. They tend to snap and stuff like that when you're using them for miniatures. But for terrain, I think they work great. You know, lay a piece of stick on a piece of, on a on a dis on a base for the terrain or or something like that, and it's fine. Um, and then I've got another product back here. Actually, it's getting out of the way. This is a DOS modeling clay. It's a name brand. You can use a lot of different brands. Actually, DOS modeling clay is great for using as it's an air drying clay so you don't have to bake it you don't have to anything you can roll up like little balls of it to make rocks um, and do various cool things with it um, so it's just kind of useful as that it's kind of something that you don't have to to fuss with otherwise so another great product that I, I like to keep on my terrain board uh, my terrain manufacturing area to have as uh, something available Trees. Now, everybody, I, there's a, lot of, a couple of different schools on trees. I tend to like these. A uh, uh, couple of companies are making them where there's these plastic armatures, and then they include like some clump foliage and some of this loose that's really like a cotton ball, but it's loose, whatever, and you wrap your tree with that first, spread it out to kind of give your tree some bulk to it before you glue your clump foliage on. I like these. They tend to be, uh, this clump foliage tends to not stick as well when you do it yourself as I found with some of the pre-built ones, but the cost is far less for the volume of trees that you can get at the size that looks good at on, on a Warhammer table. Hey, what do you know? It's getting to be Halloween time, and that means that pretty much all the stores have great little skulls. So guess what? I got me I got me a bag of uh, these are fairly large skulls, but let me go. They'll, they'll look great on some terrain projects. Uh, after all, we're playing Games Workshop products. Can't have enough skulls, right? Uh, another product that I find very useful are these little round. They're just real round balls. They're used for various craft projects. Maybe you're making planets for your Star Star Wars game. Maybe you're making uh, or Battlefleet Gothic or or anything or maybe you're making like little lava bubbles on something there's lots of different usages for little bubbles like that another thing that I found really useful is aquarium plants so these look really good on say some jungle terrain or maybe some 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 funky things to add to your jungle forests or perhaps uh, you've got an underwater and aquatic table you're working on so those are great for that so let's talk um, one other thing always have around, and this just go, should go without saying, but I'm going to say it anyway, is paper towel. You need to have it to clean your brushes, you want to have it to clean up messes, 
Another thing you want to have is you want to have plenty of newspaper to protect your work surface. As you can see, as you can just see when I was showing the paints, you had paper towel there. Uh, it was kind of our newspaper there that was already got some paint on it from me working on some train projects even this week. And finally, I always keep a notepad, which I'm actually going to use when I'm done with this this uh, video to actually write the blog post and try kind of write down all the items so I don't forget while I'm writing the blog post. Next, so we've talked about foam board or uh, foam core. This is a sheet of foam core. It's about a quarter inch thick. It's wrapped. It's got a paper wrap on the both sides of the foam. It's in the in the center to give it kind of a uh, strengthening agent. It's really used, most people use them for garage signs or you know, some kind of yard sign or whatever. But uh, I have, there's uh, lots of tutorials out there on how you make foam core buildings. In fact, first uh, terrain cast, I was making a foam core building with some Hearst Art Blocks elements, some balsa wood mixed in. So those are kind of great things to, to note. Now, uh, blue, uh, foam. So foam comes in usually half inch, at least the stuff that I buy in either half inch or one inch or two inch denominations. It's an insulation foam. Yeah, you can get it pretty much anywhere. I've got a couple of examples. Here's some pink foam. Uh, this is a half inch piece and I actually had it for a different project so it's already been flocked and glued. Uh, but I've since tore that project down and I'm using it for something else. Um, and then I've got some blue foam here. These are just some scrap pieces, but these are still really good pieces for being able to tur be turned into something smaller, so I keep them around. I actually have a box that I throw the larger scrap chunks right in so that uh, when I'm done with cleanup, I still have them saved. I can work on them later. Maybe those will be a small hill or a rock ridge. I don't know. And this is definitely I could turn into a hill or something like that. Now, what else do we have here? Did I hit everything? Hmm. I think I said I was going to talk about resin. Now this, okay, <coughs> resin. This happens to be a two-part resin that I like to use for water effects. It's a brand I picked up at uh, local Michaels here in town. I actually uh, was watching uh, videos by the train wench, if you remember back, I think it was, she was on in episode six of the podcast. She was uh, after that episode, I believe, she did these bubbling pubbles, and, and in the background I saw that she was using this product, so I went out and just bought this product as a good starter reference for doing some resin, some resin casting. It's a clear, clear it, it dries clear, so I put up pictures today of my finished uh, fountain that I did out of her start blocks, and this is the product that I used to pour that water effect. Um, so it looked brilliant, it was easy to do, follow the instructions, it's very easy, it is toxic, so make sure that you follow all the instructions clearly, um, but not something you really need in your normal uh, terrain, you know, working, you know, a, a river can be as simple as a piece of card, a piece of corrugated cardboard painted brown with some flock, you know, some flock on it and then paint the water blue with maybe some little lighter blue or white ripples in it to uh, represent water flowing. It doesn't have to be complicated like using resin, but if you want it terrain to look, if you want your water features to look better, definitely look at a water effect product or look at uh, a clear two-part resin like that. Um, I'll definitely do some tutorials. I've got a bridge that I'm going to be doing some more water effects on for a river that's going underneath it very soon so hopefully I'll shoot that up as a video and give you some tut uh, tutorials on using water effects in your train as well. Okay, uh, of course you want you know plastic cups for drying your brush, you know rinsing off brushes on, holding water, mixing your resin, whatever it is. Um, I like to have uh, a couple of Tupperware, uh, bigger Tupperware containers just for when I'm dusting a piece of terrain, like a base with a shaker or something like that, I can collect the, the loose flock as I knock it off, is it always too much? And I can then collect it and not lose that to being on the floor or being lost that way. And uh, as far as other tools, that's pretty much it. Um, 
I would recommend it's not a nece it's not a necessary tool, but I would recommend uh, at some point if you're going to work with a lot of blue foam that you would pick up a hot wire knife for cutting the foam. This happens to be I'm not even sure what this product is, but it's from Hot Wire Foam Factory. It's their uh, I guess lesser version. You can see I can push the blades tur currently turned off. This does get very hot when it's on, but it has an on-off switch, so it's kind of nice that way. Um, but this isn't, this is a, a one temperature. It's only, I came with a, the plug it's got, so it's only a one temperature knife. You don't have a lot, you don't have the ability to do variable temperatures, but you can do cool things by changing the blade and whatever, changing the blade shape and stuff to change it. It'll just whoop right through like that um, on your piece of foam. So that's another great tool to have in your collection. And that's what I've been actually using on uh, like these to get these kind of cool sandstony looks to it. I've been using that blade and, and doing that. All right, I think that's it. That's uh, all the terrain tools that I have here down in the studio. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap this video up. I hope you've gotten something good out of this and enjoyed it. And next time where I'll go ahead and and talk a little bit about doing something specific for one of the projects that I've been basically working on doing um, for prepping for the Merry Mayhem tournament this year. Alright, thanks for watching. Peace out. Make sure that you catch our, our podcast and all of our episodes at http colon slash slash wiscodice.com that was wiscodice.com you can go ahead and go to the website and listen to all our podcasts there they're all available. You can catch our RSS feed. You can always catch us on on uh, iTunes, Stitcher Smart Radio, or uh, BlackBerry Podcasts. We're listed on all those form on all those uh, uh, feeds as well. All those places. Uh, you can go ahead and, and send us an email if you'd like, or post a comment here. We appreciate that. I'll, we'll definitely respond and follow up with you. Send us an email to hosts at whispodice.com. Uh, thanks to Lastware for helping us out all the time, giving us a place to play, and and giving us a great, great place to get all our models here in town. So, I think I covered everything. Thanks a lot. Peace out.